Okay, so first we want to talk about where demand curves come from and what they actually represent in real life here. So we talked about this briefly in the previous section um, where a willingness to pay is, is this demand curve. But what this really means in real life is it's how much you're willing to pay for something, how much value you place on something. And the cool thing about this is it actually reflects preferences. So all of this indifference curve stuff that we've been talking about, where we've been trying to decide how you want to split your money between waffles and calzones, or waffles and all other goods, or anything like that, um, if you add up everybody's individual preferences based on indifference curves, based on the choices that people are making and how they spend their money and how they spend their budgets, if you add all of that up, what you end up getting is aggregate demand, which is a real thing. Um, but it's really hard to calculate because, again, nobody like nobody has kind of a, a uniform way of measuring utility. Um, you can't read people's minds and, and actually measure the utils that they're getting from different things. Um, but economists have found ways of getting at that using statistics and using surveys. So to find one person's willingness to pay for something and then aggregating that to kind of all of society, um, what you essentially do is you can send out a survey where you say, would you be willing to spend some amount of money for something? So if we go to the book example, we could send out a survey to a whole bunch of people and ask people, would you be willing to pay $10 for a book? Would you be willing to pay $90 for a book? Would you be willing to pay $1 for a book? And so you just vary that amount and you count how many people are willing to pay at different levels. Um, and so you count up all of the people that are willing to pay at each price. You can do other fancy like conjoint analysis or lots of other ways of, of trying to get at this. Um, and then once you do that, you can basically use statistics to draw a line of how much, how many people are willing to pay for stuff at different prices. So this is from the, uh, the textbook. This shows um, the relationship between the quantity of Cheerios that exist in the world and the price people are willing to pay for those Cheerios. So if you look down at this end here, um, if Cheerios are $7 per pound, not very many people are willing to pay for that. Um, the quantity here is gonna be like 100. So they're only gonna be able to sell like 100 boxes of Cheerios if they're priced at $7 a pound. There are some people out in the world, based on their surveys, that are willing to pay $7 for a box of Cheerios. And they would do that because they really like Cheerios, they get tons of utility out of it, in their indifference curves, um, inside their heads, they really, really love Cheerios and so they're gonna spend all of their money on Cheerios and that's great. Um, and so that's what that is showing here. So up here, there's not a ton of people willing to pay a ton of money for Cheerios. Um, down at this end here, on the other hand, um, let's switch here. So down at this end, um, there are like 80,000 people who are willing to pay like 50 cents for a pound of Cheerios. Everybody's fine paying a super low price for Cheerios. Nobody's going to be sad about that. Um, but if companies like actually sold Cheerios for that much money, they would run out of Cheerios pretty quick, probably. Um, so this line here, the cool thing about this is it shows kind of the preferences for everybody in society here, um, where not very many people want really expensive Cheerios. Everybody wants really, really cheap Cheerios. And somewhere here in the middle, there's going to be kind of a sweet spot where the company can choose kind of the best price for Cheerios. Um, based on their own costs and how much it, it costs to make these Cheerios. Um, so that's that's what this demand curve comes from. It's actual surveys that people send out um, and they say like how willing are people to pay some amount of money for Cheerios and they just kind of count up how many people are going to do that. Um, and that Again, this is what happens in real life. There's this really cool paper here um, where these three economists decided to measure the demand or the willingness to pay for um, hair regrowth products um, to solve male pattern baldness. And it's kind of the punniest title I've ever seen here. Um, it's willingness to pay, um, where they, they conduct a survey. They wanted to calculate how much people were willing to pay to move from one level of baldness to no baldness. Um, and they found, um, they actually like derived a whole formula for this. Um, so there's an equation that people can use now, that companies can use if they're interested in selling um, hair regrowth products. Um, they found that people on average are willing to pay about $30,000 to go from total baldness to no baldness. 
And uh, what actually happened, um, here's their survey. They just manipulated these different numbers here. So they said, um, let's say you're currently at a seven in baldness, which is like this. And let's pretend it's possible to move to a four. So moving from seven to four here. And then they ask, would you be willing to pay $10,000 to do that? And then yes, no, or, or I'll think about it. And so they sent this out to a whole bunch of people and randomized um, these numbers. And they said, you're at a six, could, how much would you be willing to pay to move to a five? If you're at a five, would you be willing to move to a two with some amount of money? And they just asked a whole bunch of different questions using different numbers and different jumps in levels. And then using statistics, they were able to figure out the demand curve um, and figure out the actual willingness to pay um, for people who wanted um, hair regrowth products. And that, that's how you do this in the real world. And so again, here's this, this Cheerios example. Um, this is the same process you go through for any um, demand curve. Um, demand curves almost always go down. They slope downward um, because people aren't going to like, it's not going to start sloping up. Like fewer people are going to want to pay for it if it's um, super expensive. Um, so like, again, as something gets cheaper, more people are going to pay for it. So pretty much all the time you'll see a downward sloping demand curve. Um, that's one way to remember which is which because you always have like a supply curve and a demand curve. Demand goes down. Supply does not go down. So demand down. Remember that you should be good. So that's how demand curves work.